Good evening, and um, thank you everyone for joining us, and I do hope you will find this talk interesting. Tonight's subject is new light on the orders, and I'm going to start by showing you photographs of two buildings. On the left is a bridge, part of the landscape of Prior Park near the city of Bath, and on the right is a view of the circus in Bath itself. Both of these are what we would call classical buildings. And by this, we mean that they use the basic building blocks of classical architecture, which we call the orders. I should explain from the outset that I'm an architect and most of my time is spent in practice. Some, but not all, of the buildings that I've designed are classical, and I will show you two examples. The first is a detail of a garden front of a new house in Wiltshire. Immediately, you can see that this uses a similar language to the previous two buildings. Most obviously, the four columns that you see attached to the wall and the beam that spans between them. And the second, in the middle of this picture, is a new art gallery in London. This is slightly different from the other examples, as it doesn't have any columns. So what makes this building and the other examples classical and what do we mean by the orders? There will be some in the audience tonight who are also classical architects. We are all part of a movement, but what I've noticed is that the contemporary practice of classical architecture relies mainly on old theories. For it to have continued relevance, do we perhaps need a new theory or at least to shed some new light on the orders. So this evening's talk is going to be about both the theory and practice of the orders. We will be asking, one, what are the orders and how are they used in practice? Two, how are the orders described in theory in published form? And three, why are the orders relevant today? Let's start with the first question, what are the orders? Here is a simple drawing of what we call the five orders. To summarize, in Greek antiquity, there were originally two orders, the Doric and Ionic. To this was added an enhanced version of the Ionic, which was called the Corinthian. These three orders were then used in Roman antiquity, during which time various hybrid orders were also developed. During the Renaissance, the ruins of antiquity were reconsidered and rationalized. And since the mid 16th century, we have been familiar with the idea of five orders, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite. They are usually presented in this way, a set of five columns from the thickest on the left to the thinnest on the right. It's also worth noting that the orders are presented here without any specific scale or material. We will look at each of the orders in turn, using some drawings from my sketchbooks. I've been recording buildings in sketchbooks for about 25 years now, and I never cease to be amazed by the extraordinary variety that exists within classical buildings in different parts of the world, built at different times and with different materials, but all based on the simple idea of these five orders. I'm going to start with the Doric. And in fact, these three examples are all quite similar versions of Doric temples. On the top right is a temple in Agrigento in Sicily. Below this is the Royal High School in Edinburgh. And on the left is a country house in Hampshire known as the Grange. What we call the Doric order is made up of a post and a beam. Looking at the drawing on the left, you will see that the post is a column with a capital on the top, on which rests the beam, which is called the entablature. If we look at the detail of the Doric entablature, you will see that this is punctuated with regularly spaced rectangular blocks, each with three grooves in them. These are called triglyphs, from the Greek for three grooves. Here are some more examples of the Doric order. On the left is a detail of a boathouse in Prospect Park, Brooklyn in New York. And on the right is a detail of a palace in Noto in Sicily. 
Both of these are measured drawings. That is to say, I have measured the buildings with a tape measure and drawn them to scale on site in a hardback sketchbook. I like this as a way of recording buildings, as it is much more accurate than judging things by eye. And accuracy is important when it comes to questions of proportion. In both of these examples, we again see the regularly spaced triglyphs that I mentioned before. To some people, each triglyph resembles the end of a joist, with the small tassels or gutty below being like wooden pegs to hold the beam in place. To others, the triglyph represents a tripod on which sacrifices were made outside a temple, and the gutty are like drops of blood hanging below. So immediately within the Doric order, we have associations with material, the timber used for temples, and with function, the temple being a site of sacrifices. In antiquity, each of the orders was also connected with particular gods, as we learn from the Roman author Vitruvius. In the case of the Doric, it was the more military or manly gods like Mars and Jupiter. From here, we get the idea that the Doric is not only masculine, but also can be rather aggressive. Next, let's look at the Ionic order, traditionally said to have a matronly character and more feminine than the Doric. We immediately see this more feminine character on the left, a circular arcaded building in Villeneuve les Avignon in France. At the top right is a country house in Berkshire called Basildon Park, which has an Ionic portico. And below this is the facade of an American bank now reconstructed in the Met in New York. The most recognisable part of the Ionic order is the capital, with its spiralling scrolls, which are called volutes. Vitruvius described these as being like the curls of a maiden's hair. They might also remind us of spiral forms found in nature, such as nautilus shells or ram's horns. Their origins lie in earlier Egyptian capitals that were based on stylized plant forms. And so the use of the Ionic order in antiquity carried a memory of earlier civilizations. On the top left now is an Ionic portico of the National Gallery of Scotland in Edinburgh. And below this is a capital from the Great Court of the British Museum in London. Both of these museums were built in the early 19th century, when the Ionic order was often chosen for buildings with a didactic function. On the right are some more Ionic capitals. The one at the top right is from the Temple of Artemis in Sardis, now in the Met in New York. And at the bottom right is a capital from the Royal Chapel in Copenhagen in Denmark. Next, we have the Corinthian order. This began as a luxury version of the Ionic order. And on the left, you can see a building that has an Ionic order on the lower story and a Corinthian order above it. This is the Villa Julia in Rome. On the right are two courtyards built in late 15th century Italy, both using the Corinthian order. At the top is from the Palazzo Ducale in Gubbio, and below this is the courtyard of the Palazzo Ducale in Urbino. Both of these drawings are measured perspectives made on site. On the left now is the Church of Santa Maria dei Monti in Rome. What we find in Rome from the middle of the 16th century is that the orders were used to reflect status, morality and character, either of the building's purpose or of its patron. Since the rebuilding of St. Peter's, the Corinthian order had become a symbol of the triumph of Roman Catholicism, and therefore most churches in Rome use the Corinthian order. The Corinthian capital has an interesting story behind it. According to Vitruvius, a young maiden had died and her possessions were put in a basket, onto which a tile was placed. In time, an acanthus plant took root under the basket and grew up around it, its leaves curling back as they reached the tile at the top. A sculptor called Callimachus was passing 
and seeing the beauty of this object made a drawing of it. As we look at the Corinthian capital on the right, we see these different elements, the form of the basket, the tile on the top, and rows of acanthus leaves. This capital is from St Mary at Church in the city of London. The legend associated with the grave of a maiden, together with the acanthus plant, which was traditionally a symbol of the afterlife, gives us the idea that the Corinthian order is associated with death and rebirth. It is also named after the city of Corinth, a famous centre of bronze casting. This may account for the ambitious nature of the capital's modelling, which, when rendered in more breakable materials, are liable to damage. We might think of the Corinthian, therefore, as the most fragile of the orders. The capital on the left has two rows of leaves. This is from the Royal Palace in Copenhagen. On the right is part of a Corinthian entablature. This is the cornice of the Temple of Concord in Rome. You will see that the cornice has regularly spaced projecting scrolls, which are called medillions. Together with the decorated capitals, these give the Corinthian order an extravagant character. So we've now dealt with the big three, the Doric, Ionic and Corinthian orders. And the next to look at is the composite order. If we look at the capital on the left, you will see that this has both the large volutes of an Ionic capital combined with the acanthus leaves of the Corinthian. It is therefore a hybrid order, the composite, originating in antiquity, but given its own name in the Renaissance. The capital on the left was designed by Inigo Jones for a screen in Winchester Cathedral and survives there as a fragment. And the capital on the right is from the Archaeological Museum in Split. This is rather unusual in that rather than having two rows of acanthus leaves, the upper row is made up of thinner, stiff leaves which resemble fluting. And so lastly, we come to the Tuscan order. This is, in essence, a simplified version of the Doric. Their details are very similar and they can easily be confused, but I would say that there are three main differences. The first is the height of the column, which is usually given a ratio of seven to one relative to the bottom diameter of the column shaft, whereas the Doric is normally eight to one. The second difference is that Tuscan columns are normally more widely spaced than the other orders, particularly when the entablature is made of timber, which allows wider spans. And thirdly, the Tuscan order does not normally have triglyphs. There are two examples shown here. On the left is the door case of a house in Winchester, dating from around 1790. Because these columns are made of timber, they are much thinner than a Tuscan order would normally be. In fact, they are around nine and a half diameters high. On the right is a detail of the west front of Tintin Hull House in Somerset, which has both a Tuscan door case and giant Tuscan pilasters on the corners of the house. Both versions of the Tuscan order here are also slimmer than usual being around eight and three quarter diameters high. So it just goes to show that rules are not always followed. What I've shown you so far are fairly conventional uses of the orders, but there are of course unconventional versions too. On the left is a detail of a Doric order from the Royal Palace in Copenhagen. You will see that above the column in the middle of the entablature, where you would expect there to be a triglyph, it has been left out and we see only the leftover pegs that would normally hang off the bottom of the triglyph. In other words, there is an architrave and a cornice, but no frieze. The same thing has happened on the image on the right, which is the front door of a house in Oxford. Next, we have some unusual capitals. On the left is a detail of a stone door case built in around 1500 now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's hard to place which order this might be. 
the column is square rather than circular, and the capital seems to combine elements of both the Doric and the Corinthian. At the top right are two capitals from a cinema in Stockholm, built in the 1920s. They were designed by Gunnar Asplund, an architect who attempted to expand the classical vocabulary to make buildings that were recognisably Swedish, as had happened with national romantic movements in other countries. These capitals seem to be closest to Ionic and Corinthian, but are not at all of a conventional type. On the bottom right are two capitals that are frequently found in Ottoman architecture. They are called lozenge and stalactite capitals. In this case, both from the top Kapi Palace in Istanbul. Why should these and other column capitals from other regions of the world not also be part of the classical canon? Classical architecture goes beyond just columns and entablatures. And another important aspect of the orders is the use of decoration and enrichment. Here on the screen are two examples of bas-relief scroll decoration, also called ranso. The example on the left is in the Soane Museum in London, and on the right is from the Arapaches in Rome. Both of these examples are carved in marble, but ranso decoration can also be modelled and cast. Here we see examples made in other materials. On the left is a cast terracotta tile of an Etruscan temple from the 4th century BC, still with fragments of its original paint. On the right is a part of a door at the Villa Torlonia in Rome, built in around 1810, showing the amazing quality of bronze casting that could be achieved at a fine scale. Before the widespread development of metal casting, iron could be worked by hand by a blacksmith, and this is called wrought iron. Different countries developed specific traditions and character of their wrought iron work, and here are some English examples. At the top left are 18th century staircase balustrades, now in the Brooking collection, and the bottom left is from Somerset House in London. The top right was originally from Pembroke House in London and is now in the Queen's House in Greenwich. And the bottom right is from a country house in Worcestershire. It becomes very clear in looking at these examples that their form is very specifically linked to both their scale and their material. Let's look at some examples of balustrades made in other materials. On the left, is a balustrade from the Villa Cetinale near Siena, made in stone. At the top right are two marble balustrades from side chapels in Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome. Below this is a timber balustrade from the anatomical theatre in the University of Bologna. And you can see at a glance that the timber balusters are much thinner than the stone ones. On the screen now, are two examples of cast metal objects. On the left is a lamppost in Copenhagen in the form of a very slender column on a pedestal. Driven by the functional requirement for a lamppost to be thin, these could only be made in cast iron. It is a beautiful design, changing at intervals from square to quatrefoil in plan, at each point articulated by the mouldings that make up the orders. On the right is a gilt brass urn mounted on a green marble base. The nature of the material is clearly evident in the form. The base is simple and cubic to show off the veining of the marble, while the urn itself is intricately modelled and enriched. If you look at the section on the right hand side of the drawing, you will see how thin the metal really is. How different this profile would look if it was made in stone. I could show you many more sketchbook drawings, but I'm going to keep it to just two more examples. One thing that classical architecture does not normally do is colour, even though it is known that Greek temples and sculpture were originally painted in bright colours. So here are drawings showing pattern and colour, 
perhaps not conventionally classical, but I think an important part of this broad language that we are discussing. On the left are patterned floors from Siena Cathedral. They are simple geometric patterns in three colours, but how much they remind us of Siena, that city of black and white marble and red brick, with its maze-like cluster of narrow streets and castellated medieval palaces. On the right are tiled wall patterns from Seville. And again, these are simple geometric patterns, but how much they remind us of the Moorish influence on that city. The deep blue of the sky, the red of the bullring, and the green and orange of the city's famous orange trees. This is important because, although classicism has been used as a fairly universal language, it finds ways through the use of the orders, decoration, pattern, colour and material of becoming local. So to conclude this first part, I started by asking what are the orders and why are they important? I hope it will be clear from seeing how they are used that the orders are a rich decorative language that combines function with symbolism and meaning. And so this leads us back to the diagram that we started with. It is a simple drawing that shows us at a glance the sequence of the five orders and their typical appearance. But there are some problems with this diagram too, so I will give you a handful of questions to consider. Firstly, let's think about the Doric order for a moment. It was used by both the Greeks and the Romans, and while the two versions are similar, they are certainly not interchangeable. So when we show the five orders, should the Doric be Greek or Roman? Secondly, the orders are intentionally presented here without any reference to scale or material. This suggests that they are not adaptable, whereas in practice, we've seen that the orders are very varied hugely depending on both their scale and their material. Thirdly, we see in reality many buildings in which the orders are mixed up. We have already seen that the composite order is a hybrid of the Ionic and Corinthian. But even in Greek antiquity, many temples had Doric and Ionic elements combined together. So often in practice, we see an overlapping between the orders, but this diagram makes them necessarily separate. Fourthly, what about the idea of abstracted orders in which parts of the vocabulary are omitted or stripped away? If you walk around most towns and cities, you will see classical buildings that are based on the proportions of the orders, but without any columns or pilasters, what are known as A-stylar buildings. Where is the place for these in this diagram? And lastly, perhaps most importantly, this drawing leads us to think of the orders simply as decorative devices, with no hint of their origins or meaning. Without this meaning, they become easy to dismiss, as in fact they largely have been. How many schools of architecture even teach the orders anymore? They might be mentioned in history lessons, but certainly wouldn't be given any modern relevance. How did all this meaning get lost? It is not just a result of this diagram. And to answer the question, we need to look briefly at how the orders have been shown in books over the years. The orders start to be written about in the early Renaissance with the publishing of architectural treatises. The earliest of these broadly followed the structure that had been set by Vitruvius. As well as descriptions of their appearance, the orders were connected with gods, the Tuscan with Atlas, the Doric with Minerva, Mars and Hercules. The Ionic could be either female, Juno and Diana, or male, Bacchus, for example, and the Corinthian was connected with Venus and Flora. With the coming of the age of humanism in the 15th century, the orders were increasingly connected with people. The Tuscan was usually a farmer, the Doric a soldier, the Ionic a matron, and the Corinthian a maiden. But later, towards the end of the 15th century, as books start to include illustrations, we get some more inventive interpretations. As well as the orders, architects are writing about the design of fortifications and cities. On the left 
is a plan of an ideal city called Sportzinda in a book by the architect Filaretti. Its octagonal shape could almost be a reflected plan of a Corinthian capital. On the right is an illustration from a book called the Hypnorotomachia Polyphily, published in Venice in 1499. Here the orders are encountered in a dream through a mythical landscape, rich in meaning and allegory, with the buildings themselves appearing like characters in a play. This seemingly romantic idea was developed by the English author John Shute, whose anthropomorphic illustrations of the orders, published in 1563, range from the noble savage of the Doric, seen on the right, to the young maiden of the Corinthian. Shute's descriptions began to imply a morality to the orders, not just a savage, but a noble savage. And the later English author, John Wootton, would go on to describe the composite order in a disparaging way as lasciviously decked like a wanton courtesan. In a book by the Flemish architect Hans Vredemann de Vries, published in 1577, the orders are linked to the ages of man. Starting in reverse order, the composite represents childhood, the Corinthian is youth, the Ionic is an adult woman, the Doric shown here, an adult man, and the Tuscan is old age. Vredemann's son Peter made a further leap in producing a set of engravings showing the orders, each linked to one of the five senses. Sight was represented by the Tuscan order, hearing by Doric, smell by Ionic, taste by Corinthian, and touch by composite. Clearly, there was always a strong link between the form and proportions of columns and those of the human body. But it is clear during this period that for many architects, the orders embodied deeper human qualities, or to put it another way, the orders formed a lens through which to see all of life. It is significant that treatises of this period also covered many other subjects, such as materials, location, orientation, water management, and astronomy, showing how important it was that architecture should be in harmony with the natural world. Perhaps the most groundbreaking treatise of the 16th century was written by Sebastian Serlio. The title page of his third book, seen on the left here, and devoted to the ruins of ancient Rome, seems to carry some of the romantic atmosphere of earlier books. But on the right is his more scientific illustration of the five orders, the first time that they had appeared in print in this form with their now familiar names. It was a formula that was to be quickly taken up by others. We might think of Vignola's treatise, or perhaps even more of Palladio's, seen here. Palladio was a stonemason rather than a theorist, and his four books on architecture published in 1570 contain nothing about the origins, symbolism, or meaning of the five orders. Palladio's book was to be hugely influential in Britain, America, and elsewhere, and resulted in a more rigid and limited attitude as to what the five orders could be. They became so constrained that inevitably there were many attempts made to unravel or ridicule them. In 1767, William Hogarth published the engraving on the left of the five orders of periwigs, which satirized architects' strict adherence to rules made in the ancient world. And there were often suggestions made for the invention of new orders, particularly ones that were specific to the nationality of the architects. On the right here, we see James Adams' suggestion for a Britannic order where the usual scrolls and leaves at the top corners of the capital are replaced by a lion and a unicorn. Later treatises, particularly in the 19th century, tended to follow a more scientific approach, such as the Parallel of the Orders of Architecture by the French architect Charles Normand, seen on the screen here. This, essentially, has been our inheritance through the 20th century and to the present day with discussion about the orders amongst architects now being mainly related to their proportions, 
and to their academically correct detail. So let's reflect on all of this for a moment, returning to our chart of the five orders. We've seen that the form and use of the orders might relate to their origins, their suitability for different building types, functions and locations, their associations with building materials, and their connections with different gods and with different types of people, as seen here. There are other things to consider too. The orders have often been used to deliver a political message. This could be one of tyranny. We will all be aware that many dictators have used classical architecture as a symbol of power and oppression. But the orders have also been used to represent liberal democracy. In the revival of Greek forms, the orders became a manifestation of the Scottish Enlightenment in the late 18th century. Again, in the 1920s in Sweden and Denmark, classical architecture symbolized progressive attitudes to political reform and was widely used for social housing projects. So again, we see that this is a language that can have many political meanings. As well as symbolism, the orders are also used very differently depending on local conditions of climate and geology. In this way, they are a reflection of nature. Whilst the orders may be presented as a universal system, through use in different countries and different regions, they can become a kind of local vernacular, essentially different dialects being spoken within a common language. So I want to now bring this discussion back to the present day to answer the question, what relevance do the orders have to the modern world? I would say that just at the moment, there seem to be two great challenges facing us. The first is environmental. How can we live in balance with the natural world and make buildings and cities in a more sustainable way? And the second great challenge to my mind is how we can make a more tolerant society that promotes religious and ethnic diversity. In facing these two challenges, both of which involve finding some harmonious balance, might the orders with their roots in the natural world and their seemingly endless variety provide us with some answers? I think that the answer is yes, but if so, we need to find a way of representing the orders in allegorical form that would give us a sense of the enormous diversity and breadth of what is possible. And my suggestion is this. As well as columns, the orders have been compared to gods and people. Let's now consider them as places. Instead of five columns lined up like candlesticks, let us imagine five settlements connected by the winding path of a river. This is the classical landscape. This metaphor allows us to explore each order in turn, but also encourages us to look for connections, the paths and roads between them. It also provides space for hybrid orders that might be, for instance, between the Doric and the Corinthian, and provides space for unusual peripheral orders and the development of new types, the as yet uncharted territories. Each order is surrounded by a different form of natural landscape, giving clues as to their connections with materials and even building techniques. So let's look at what each order might look like, starting with the Tuscan. Traditionally representing male strength, the Tuscan order was connected with the god Atlas. Here the Tuscan is shown as a walled farm, surrounded by a canal ditch beyond which are fertile pastures. In the four corners of the farm are square pavilions set at angles to face inwards. And at the centre is a circular tower. If personified, the Tuscan order would be a farmer or gardener. And if we were to associate the Tuscan with a theme, it would be of germination and growth. Into the surrounding ground at the right foreground, has been dug a clay pit. Let's therefore consider clay as the natural material associated with the Tuscan, and its building technique will be brick making and moulded terracotta. 
Associated with military strength, the Doric order has been compared to the gods Mars and Hercules. The forms of the Doric order are said to be derived from timber construction, as it is assumed was found in early temples. Here, the Doric is shown as a fort. Built at first as a military camp in timber, and later given more permanence in masonry. The fort is defended at its corners and is surrounded by a moat formed from the river. The Doric is personified as a soldier or warrior and its theme is therefore of war. The fort is built in a clearing in dense woodland. The Doric's natural raw material, as we would expect, is timber and its building technique is carpentry and joinery. Compared to the Tuscan and Doric orders, the Ionic is said to embody a more feminine character. Gods associated with the Ionic could, however, be either feminine or masculine, suggesting that it is the most asexual of the orders. As we've seen, the capitals of naturalistic form, based on fossil shells or ram's horns. The Ionic is shown here as a garden city. Not fortified in any way, it is more welcoming, surrounded by a circular canal over which span bridges reaching out into the surrounding landscape. A place of crescents and circuses, the Ionic is also the forerunner of the modern suburb. The Ionic order in human form is a nurse or mother, and its theme is of peace and healing. Within the surrounding landscape are found lakes and mountains, the natural habitat of both the ram and the fossil. The Ionic's natural raw material is therefore stone, and its building technique is carving and masonry. Usually connected with a younger female form, the Corinthian was associated with more virginal gods. It is known particularly for its ornate foliate capitals and its more decorative entablature. The Corinthian is depicted here as a walled citadel, highly defended and surrounded by ramparts. The personification of the Corinthian is a young maiden and its theme is death and rebirth. Beyond the walls lie a cemetery, the habitat of the acanthus and the cypress, and the surrounding landscape is covered by reed beds. The material of the Corinthian is reeds and its technique is weaving. Lastly, formed from a joining of the Ionic and Corinthian orders, the composite is shown here as a port. Here we find both the defended citadel and its spreading suburbs, between which has grown a ring of industry. The composite is the most messy and complex of the orders and is a forerunner of the modern city. It is also the home of iniquity. The person best representing the composite is the courtesan, and its theme is vice. The city is surrounded by a rocky coastline from which comes its raw material, iron ore, and its technique is metalwork. These then are alternative ways of considering the orders to encompass much more than simply their visual appearance. And this now enables us to greatly expand the chart of the orders and what they represent. If this all seems very prescriptive, it is important to say that the themes, materials and techniques do not only have to belong to each order. A Doric column might very well be made of stone or metal and might be used to represent peace more than war. And all of this encourages us to see the orders as overlapping one another. Now, there may be some in this audience who are thinking, this is all very well, but what is the point of it all? There are very few classical buildings built these days. And how many modern buildings are ever going to use the five orders? If this is you, I would say this. The classical language is by far the most expressive means of building that has ever existed. There is no good reason why it should not continue to be used, but it does of course need to adapt to modern conditions. And to illustrate this point, here are some examples of recent buildings that I've designed using the orders in different ways. 
The first is a Greek Doric order for the front door of a stone built house. It is mostly academically correct, with the slight exception of the concave undercutting to the neck of the capital, found in several of the temples at Paestum. It gives it a lighter and more decorative character than the normal Greek Doric, which seemed appropriate for the owners of this house. The second is a very conventional Doric order, taken almost straight from Palladio's book. It belongs to a house for a couple who were very Doric in character and had a passion for the architecture of the Veneto. If we had to situate this order on our map, it would be right in the heart of the Doric fort, a dead straight Roman Doric. The next example is on the garden front of a new country house. It is on a site surrounded by trees. And so remembering the Doric order's woodland setting, the triglyphs are panelled here rather than incised as a memory of the Doric's origins in carpentry. This order faces due south, so it was worth making engaged columns rather than pilasters to maximise the modelling of shadows as the sun moves round the house during the day. The next example is part of a garden pavilion, representing the slightly mischievous side of the owner's character. This order borrows motifs from the Mannerist period and suggests a building that is only half finished. The columns are buried in rough uncut stone blocks and the triglyphs have not been carved at all. Here is another example, again with an uncut triglyph and also with uncut gutty below. It is the front door of a country house in a rather remote landscape in which a more conventional Doric order would to me have seemed completely out of place. Out of place or in place seem appropriate phrases when discussing the orders, as the aim should always be to carefully tune them to their surroundings. So far, these have all been in stone, but here is an example in brick. This is part of a summer house in the grounds of a handsome 18th century house. And as is often the case with garden buildings, this presented an opportunity to do something a bit less formal. There is a simplified triglyph here, formed from the length of a standard brick, with a suggestion of its gutty formed by a brick cut in half lengthways. It is neither Doric nor Tuscan, but a hybrid based on the scale and nature of its material. The next example is from the front door of a house built for a young couple who I felt were very Ionic, but might one day become more Corinthian. And so these Ionic capitals have in the neck of the column young leaves starting to emerge that will grow up over time. This might be described as an adolescent composite order. This next order is for a house in New Delhi. This was for a couple with an interesting cultural blend. The husband was Indian and his wife was German by birth but had lived for many years in London. The order is a very academic Greek Ionic, well suited to the strong Indian sunlight as it casts crisp, fine shadows. A Greek order also seemed more appropriate to me in New Delhi than a Roman one, which, shall we say, would have carried heavier cultural baggage. In examples of the Greek Ionic from antiquity, the decorative capital with volutes only appears on columns and pilasters are given planar capitals. On this house, there are no columns, so we get only the pilaster order based on the Erechtheum in Athens. The order is combined with the Indian tradition of pierced stonework or jali to represent a cultural blend that seemed appropriate for the owners and the location. Next is an order on the front door of a new house. You can see that although this is based on the Greek Ionic pilaster order seen in the last example, here there are also mutules, shallow projecting blocks in the underside of the cornice, 
which are really a more Doric feature. This was an attempt to make a more gender neutral order for a young couple who seemed to combine both Doric and Ionic qualities. They had two small children and their close-knit family is suggested by the intertwining of the incised decoration under the capital. We are beginning to stray now away from more conventional orders towards something more abstract. This is an Ionic order for the stone front of a new room added to a 17th century manor house. There is no architrave here, and this order borrows the idea of stitching or weaving as decoration for the frieze and in place of a capital. Continuing this theme of incised woven decoration, this order is for the headquarters of a long established family of art dealers. They already had a gallery in a 19th century classical building from which they sold old masters. The purpose of the new building was to sell modern pictures. And so a simplified order that has hints of art deco or sewn at its most abstract seemed appropriate here. The symmetrical pattern that appears in place of the capital is closest, I suppose, to an Ionic order. The facade faces west on a long straight street, so that from the middle of the day, the facade is lit obliquely. This lends itself to shallow relief crisply carved in stone. And lastly, this is the ground floor of the same building, essentially a shop front order. It has a pair of thin pilasters which share a single capital, producing a visual ambiguity which is helpful in giving the order two different scales. In looking at this example, I realize I have been concentrating on the details of the orders, but there is of course much more that one could say about how they can be composed on a large scale. This is a question of architectural composition and is such a large subject as to need another whole talk in its own right. But suffice it to say that in my view, many new modern buildings would have been better composed if their architects had had some training in the use of the orders. And this in turn would raise the quality of our built environment, which might also bring with it a renewed level of civic pride. Both of the last two orders I have shown you belong to this building. One of the first images I showed you and this is where I will conclude. I hope I've shown in this talk that for those of us who use the classical language, the orders are not just cut and paste decoration. They are a complete and integrated system which also embodies allegory and meaning. The orders can be used individually or together to convey light and dark moods, strength and frailty, kindness and aggression, life and death. Buildings that use the orders are a reflection of our history and our humanity. They are, in short, mirrors of human existence. Thinking about the orders in this way, most importantly, provides a connection back to the natural world, which arguably classicism lost a long time ago. Even if this is too much of a stretch for some in this audience, I would hope that it would at least encourage us all to think of the orders in a more broad-minded way. In our more environmentally conscious world, and at a time when we should be celebrating diversity, I hope that this talk might provide some inspiration for classical architects now and in the future. Thank you.